and she went, she went right back to politics because she thought that was a safer topic. Let's just stick with politics. Well, my vision began to change in February of 2002, the day after my 48th birthday. And, I just, and after a while, it was just too embarrassing. I just didn't tell people about it. Also, because of what I knew about the critical period, I didn't think any scientists would believe me if I told them I gained stereopsis at the age of 48. So for two and a half years, I just enjoyed my vision sort of privately, only um, persecuted my family with it, like, oh, look at this, look at that. And, and they were very tolerant. But one night during Christmas vacation in 2004, I was clearing away the dinner dishes, and I suddenly thought, I have got to write my story down in narrative form. If for nobody else, at least for myself, while it's still fresh in my mind, I had kept a vision diary with all little snippets of things that had happened, but I wanted to write it down in a narrative way. So I, that night, as it just luck would have it, Dan, my husband, and the kids got involved in an all-night Monopoly game which is not that unusual in my house. And so they were, they were all happily amused. And so I went to a private, quiet room in the house with my laptop, and I wrote a letter to Oliver Sacks. Oliver Sacks is a famous neurologist and author. He wrote The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat and Awakenings, which became a movie starring Robin Williams as Oliver Sacks. How would you like Robin Williams to portray you? I figured he could even portray me. He could portray a woman. He did Mrs. Doubtfire, right? <laughs> anyway, I had met Oliver Sacks very briefly at a party in 1996, eight years earlier. And I had told him about my strabismus. Um, and uh, he had leaned in real close. At the time, I thought it was out of interest. Now I think he was looking to see, look at my eyes. But, and he had said, do you think you can imagine what the world looks like with two eyes. Because at that time, I saw with one eye or the other. And I said to him quite glibly, oh yeah, I can know, I know what it's like. I know what it's like because, you know, I'm a college professor. I teach neurobiology. I teach stereopsis in the classroom. I know the mechanism behind it. I have my students test their stereopsis in lab. And even though I don't see what they see, I think I know what I'm missing. My theoretical knowledge lets me know what I'm missing. So I started out my letter, Dear Dr. Sachs, we met on such and such a day, we had this conversation, this is what I said, and I was completely and totally wrong. And then I went on for nine single space pages <laughs> describing what it was like to see in stereo depth. The next day I showed my letter to my husband and I said, he said, are you gonna mail it? I said, no, it's just a narrative to myself. I wrote Dear Dr. Sachs, like somebody might write Dear Diary, because I used that conversation as a start off. He said, mail it. And I said, it's kind of long. And he just, I remember he threw the letter back at me. He said, just mail it. So I did. And about a week later, I got a response. <laughs> Oliver Sachs was like, I thought, you know, when I got the letter a week later that it was a form letter saying, thank you so much for your letter. And <laughs> if I have time, I'll look at it. But it wasn't, it was a typewritten name, types with two fingers, a typewritten, corrected with black magic marker letter, four pages long, saying he was fascinated by my story and could he come visit me? <laughs> well, I was thrilled. And I wrote back and I said, of course you can come visit. It's like, what do you do with Oliver Sacks coming to your house? Well, fortunately, he's written a lot of books. So I knew what he liked. He writes in his books that smoked salmon is his favorite food. So I served him smoked salmon for lunch. <laughs> he loves to go swimming. So I arranged for us to go swimming at the Mount Holyoke swimming pool. And he came with two, two friends, an ophthalmologist and a vision scientist, and we cleared away the dining room table after lunch, and he tested my stereo vision to make sure it was really legitimate and was convinced that, yes, I had gained stereopsis, and looked at pictures of me as a child. And then we went to my optometrist's office. Her name is Teresa Ruggiero in Northampton, Massachusetts, and um, went through, um, you know, she went through all the medical side of things and so on. And uh, it was a great visit, Hi, really, a, uh, really a fun two days. And then about two weeks later, I got a letter from him thanking me for the visit and asking me, do you think you're unique? Your story is so contradictory to the scientific dogma about critical periods. And I thought, there are 15 million strabismics in the US alone. Somebody else must have had this experience. I can't be unique. So I went on the web, and within a day, 
I had contacted developmental optometrists who had patients who had had similar experiences. And they got permission, and then I was able to contact their patients. So I sat down, and I wrote another letter to Oliver Sacks. And I said, I'm not unique. And I then went on for 10 pages. <laughs> and I described four other individuals who had gained stereo vision in adult life, and all of them had the same experience, the same emotional reaction, the same, my god, this is incredible reaction that I had had. Okay. And one thing led to another, many more letters, several other visits. And then Oliver calls me one day and he says, I've written a story about you. Do you mind? <laughs> and I said, no, not at all, because one of my missions is to help so many other people, not just with strabismus, but other binocular disorders, others' problems working with their two eyes. And a story by Oliver Sacks would be one way to get the message out. He named the story Stereo Sue, because that had been his nickname for me, Stereo Sue. And so Stereo Sue, oh, there's Oliver Sacks. Guess who's Oliver Sacks? Guess who's me? And guess who's my eye doctor? <laughs> my developmental optometrist, Teresa Ruggiero. There we are that day when he came to visit. And Stereo Sue uh, was the article that appeared in the New Yorker magazine. Does anyone here read the New Yorker? It's got great cartoons. OK. It appeared in the June 19, 2006 issue. And it was Robert, um, Oliver Sacks who then told my story to Robert Krolwich, who's the NPR science correspondent. And Robert Krolwich contacted me, and he did a morning edition piece on me. That's the one that Bill heard that appeared on June 26th on NPR. OK, why is stereo vision, not just for me, but for other people, why does the acquisition of stereo vision create such a tremendous change? I mean, it has a lot of logistical advantages, you, threading a needle, parking a car, and such like that, you can do much better with the improvement in depth perception. But I think it's much more. Stereopsis, the sense of being able to see the space between objects, space being palpable, the space between falling snowflakes, stereopsis provides you with a kind of qualia. A qualia, according to Ramachandran, a famous neuropsychologist in his book Phantoms in the Brain, which he wrote with, uh, co-wrote with Sandra Blakesley, Qualia, to quote from him, is the raw feel of sensations such as the subjective qualities of pain or red or notches with truffles. OK? How do I know it was a new qualia? Well, here's an example. In uh, May of 2005, I believe it was, the last Star Wars movie came out, the most recently, The, the Revenge of the Sith. And my family, they're all science fiction junkies, insisted we go to the movie on you know, midnight of the opening night. I thought they were crazy. He wants to be up at 3 in the morning watching Star Wars. But OK, that's what everyone wanted. We went to the movie theater. My husband and I were the oldest people there. But we went and we saw the Star Wars movie. Now, they always talked about the special effects. And I never understood what they were talking about. I mean, Star Wars was, yeah, it was a cute story and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't see the special effects as all that wonderful. So I'm sitting in this movie theater in May of 2005, and I'm watching Star Wars, and I'm thinking, whoa, those cinematographers, they have gotten so much better. <laughs> this movie, I mean, something happened between the fifth and the sixth movie. This is really incredible. The sense of space, the sense of those ships flying by each other. Wow, this is amazing. And then I realized. The movie had, the cinematography hadn't changed all that much from, from the last Star Wars movie. It was my perception that had changed. I could never have seen that sense of space and volume in a movie because I had never seen it before in real life. I had to gain that qualia in real life before I could see it in a movie. Okay? So what exactly is stereo?